welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast on this July 4th, 2023. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker. I'm the Executive Director of National Speaking of Women's Health. And today we're going to talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And one thing that seems to plague so many Americans is obesity. And on this happy 4th of July, Independence Day, happy birthday to America, today is a day that we celebrate our most cherished American document, the Declaration of Independence. And Thomas Jefferson penned the Declaration, wherein certain truths were asserted all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as we formed our great republic, there were several hardworking independent people who worked the land and, by and large, had quite normal to slender BMIs. But unfortunately, all the modern conveniences, the abundance of food, and the trend towards more sedentary work, the modern epidemic of obesity is actually threatening our collective life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So it's always with great anticipation that weight loss medications are approved and available as an adjunct to improving lifestyle, healthy nutrition, exercise, which are basically always our bedrocks to healthy living. But there are some cautionary tales. Uh, About a decade ago, the anti-obesity drug Belvique, Lorcasin, which was thought to work by affecting the appetite at the brain level, specifically affecting brain receptors for serotonin, which is related to satiety. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that is present throughout the body and the brain. And you might want to go back and listen to one of my earlier podcasts on why women crave chocolate. I talked a lot about the different neurotransmitters in the brain and things from foods, activities, to medications that can affect these very important neurotransmitters. So most obesity medications are only approved for people with BMIs greater than 30 or a BMI greater than 27 and at least one serious medical problem such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, fatty liver, There's so many other conditions that are linked to obesity from increased rates of cancer to gallbladder disease to degenerative joint disease with a need for joint replacements to uh, insulin resistance and metabolic problems. uh, And that can be associated with fatty liver that can progress in some cases to actually cirrhosis of the liver, especially in women. So for a lot of reasons, it's very important to be concerned about the metabolic health. That being said, um, my sons are all listed as obese based on their BMI because they're very muscular, athletic men who actually have the appropriate low level of body fat for a male. So BMI is not everything. In fact, you can be skinny fat. Uh, You can have very slight build and lose muscle and have it replaced with fat. So body composition is very, very important. And we can determine how much uh, body fat a person has very precisely on our bone density dual energy x-ray absorptiometry machine, which I have in our Center for Specialized Women's Health. And a lot of times athletes uh, and people that are really specifically following and need to know exactly what their body composition is will have this done, which is usually out of pocket. Now, getting back to that drug, Belvique Lorcasin, it was anticipated uh, for quite a long time, but the FDA initially rejected it, requiring additional safety studies. Then it got on the market 
around 2012, but by 2020, it was pulled off the market uh, due to uh, concerns about increased cancer risk. Now, in general, obese people do have a higher risk of several different kinds of cancers, including endometrial cancer in women, also colon cancer, pancreas cancer, several GI tract tumors, breast cancer. In fact, women that gain 20 to 30 pounds at midlife, which is pretty common in America, have uh, an increased risk of breast cancer similar to drinking a couple drinks of alcohol a day, which is an increased risk of breast cancer. While women with hysterectomies who don't take any uh, hormones, they have a higher risk of breast cancer than women who take estrogen, which is associated with a reduced risk of breast cancer. Now, women who have a uterus and need the estrogen plus progestin, only after a decade of use, and usually with a synthetic progestin, uh, which is very anti-estrogenic, have maybe one extra case of breast cancer per thousand women treated. Uh, So things like smoking and alcohol uh, and gaining weight uh, really significantly increase several different cancers. And a lot of times people just focus on uh, drugs uh, that are associated with a slight increased risk of cancer. Now there's other weight loss drugs that um, have been pulled off the market. And Meridia, you might remember, Silbrutramine and uh, Redux, Dexflenfluramine, also were pulled off the market. Now, there was a prescription intestinal fat blocker approved in 1999 called Zenical, and it's now over the counter in the form of Alli, A L L I. And if used in conjunction with daily exercise and a heart healthy, relatively low fat Mediterranean diet, it does seem to assist in weight loss. It blocks fat absorption from the gut. And if you have too much fatty foods, you will be punished with orange liquid fatty stools. And so for some people who think they're not eating that many calories or they're not ingesting too much gratuitous fat, uh, it can be educational. But the fight against obesity-related health problems is tough. It's very tough. And just like the American Revolutionary War was certainly no picnic, we remember Washington crossing the Delaware on Christmas Eve with his troops that uh, many didn't have shoes and tattered clothes and they were sick and frostbitten. So sometimes I think when we think we have it really tough, we really need to think about the people that came before us. And sometimes that's a motivation to keep fighting and focusing on your health. So eating a colorful diet uh, that's nutritious, it's a great time to put red, white, and blue together with some blueberries, which are a superfood. We had a podcast on that, some strawberries and some vanilla yogurt. Keep yourself strong. I mean, our motto is be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. And exercise, particularly weightlifting, is very important. And exercise is more important for helping to maintain weight loss as opposed for weight loss itself. 80% of weight loss has to do with the type of calories and the time that you ingest and the amount. Be sure to have a good working relationship with your physician and healthcare team. And even though BMI is not everything that it's cracked up to be, you can calculate your BMI. We have a BMI calculator on our speakingofwomenshealth.com website. And work with your health team to manage chronic medical conditions, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, fatty liver. Now, uh, we've had a couple of really new, exciting weight loss medications hit the market, like uh, Wegovy and also uh, Manjaro. And they are all related to the diabetic uh, drugs that have been on the market for a while. So we've had uh, Victosa uh, for diabetes uh, and Saxenda, which specifically was uh, used just for weight loss. And then we had Ozempic. We'll be back after a quick break. 
Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. was used for diabetes and the higher dose of the same drug is Wagovi. And the newest one that's a dual action agent is Manjaro. And we've had some very significant weight loss with those medicines. But there is a potential concern for increase in thyroid cancer. And so since these are relatively newer drugs and higher dose drugs than what we've used for quite a while for type 2 diabetes, so, for instance, some of these drugs are the same, uh, like Ozempic is the same as Wigovi. It's just Wigovi is a higher dose. Victosa, Saxenda are the same drug, but Saxenda is a higher dose. And they're similar to uh, Trulicity or Dulaglutide. And they can be very effective in terms of treating uh, type 2 diabetes. And they can be useful in weight loss in people who don't have diabetes. So we customarily will screen for height and weight and calculate the body mass index with all the known limitations. And the way you do this is you get your weight in kilograms and you divide it by the square of your height in meters, indicating uh, a person's BMI. So high BMIs usually, but not always, signify high body fat. And for this reason, BMI screens for weight categories associated with increased risk for health complications. And it generally is not useful to diagnose uh, health status or even body fatness. In fact, um, my granddaughter Artemis, who's very tall and she's much bigger and heavier than a lot of kids her age. Um, In fact, she's two and a half. Uh, but she acts like she's four, and she's got the vocabulary, (laughs) I think, of um, a college student some days. I mean, her baby sister, Beatrice, she was saying, Beatrice is a dentalist. She can't eat the food I'm eating. Or her latest was, creamsicles are quintessential summer. And I'm sure on this July 4th, she's going to enjoy a red, white, and blue popsicle that her kuma lisa introduced her to Uh, but she is very high on all the charts Um, height weight she's very dense and muscular just like her father and bmi and height and weight uh, just like intelligence and coloring of the body uh, is very heritable so there are a lot of genetic factors that do play a role And there's also genetic factors that make some people able to tolerate higher weights and higher percentage of fats and other people not. Even just five extra pounds of visceral body fat in some people really triggers a terrible metabolic cascade. So in general, the numbers we use, uh, BMI ranges... Uh, If you're under 18.5, it's considered underweight, as normal weight usually falls between the ranges of 18.5 to 24. But again, there are ranges, and it's kind of important to know where you've been on the chart your whole life. And there are healthy people that are very uh, underweight and slender, uh, but they are very petite and tiny. That being said, women usually need to maintain a certain percent of body fat in order to ovulate and be able to conceive. And women have more body fat than men. Usually we describe the BMIs between 25 and 27 as being concerning, perhaps a little higher than normal. 27 is generally overweight. BMIs of over 30 are considered obese um, and then 
BMIs of over 40 uh, generally are severe obesity. Now, one can have a BMI of 27 and have several health concerns, and that can medically justify treatment. So, obesity is a chronic disease, and it does affect almost 70% of American adults, and it does uh, require long-term management. Now, babies and toddlers and growing children aren't su subjected to these BMI uh, evaluations. Pregnant women, lactating women, and one reason women gain um, some extra body fat during pregnancy is for all the energy demands of lactation. So we have at least 600 to 700 million adults in the world living with obesity. And the prevalence in the United States was about 42 percent spanning the years 2017 to 2018. We've doubled the prevalence of obesity. And with the pandemic and the shutdowns and the gyms being closed uh, and just the anxiety that a lot of people uh, felt with the constant non-stop doom and gloom news, uh, obesity really skyrocketed, skyrocketed in several groups. And we know that it's associated with a lot of serious health concerns and health cost. In the United States, we spend at least $150 billion annually, and medical costs are more compared to healthy weight individuals. And a lot of people's employer-related health insurance incentivizes uh, weight loss and exercise and healthy ha health habits. Unfortunately, obesity does decrease one's lifespan. And if we're focusing on life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, you don't want a premature death. And obesity was a major risk factor along with advanced AIDS age for COVID-19 infections. And obstructive sleep apnea has skyrocketed. I diagnose a case at least once a week. Heart disease, the leading cause of death in Americans is related to hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is not always associated with obesity, but it usually is just like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which we'll talk about more in a future podcast. And as we mentioned, increased risk for cancer. So it's very challenging in our society uh, that is more sedentary, that does have so many tasty foods that are abundant. So many of our family activities, our holiday activities, events that mark special events, are associated with food. So how do we manage obesity? Um, well, it's very multifactorial and it really does require uh, a team management and something for you to be able to focus on daily in terms of planning for healthy foods, planning for exercise, getting enough sleep to reduce cortisol, monitoring caloric intake, reducing stress, and really treating any under... We'll be back after a quick break. Have you ever experienced fitness failure? You know, you set a, a goal to exercise, you're all excited, and then you're not. Hi, I'm Dave. I host the daily 10-minute podcast, Walking is Fitness. Instead of an exercise goal, I talk about making a fitness promise. And every day you keep that promise, you add another link to a growing fitness chain. This is a podcast of action. You'll create a fitness habit, which eventually becomes fitness momentum, and then on to all kinds of good stuff. Check it out. Walking is fitness, and let's take a daily 10-minute walk together. Flying, uh, sleep disorders. And certainly there have been surgical options, um, gastric sleeves, uh, major Ruin Y bariatric surgeries, which are quite uh, invasive and usually uh, certainly not first line options. 
So we still have this quest to continue for effective combination therapy. And so in June of 2021, two years ago, Wegovy, which is the generic name semiglutide, the same thing as Ozempic, but Wegovy is a 2.4 uh, milligram injection injected under the skin once a week for chronic weight management in adults who are either have obesity or they have a, an overweight situation with at least one health con condition like hypertension, high cholesterol, obstructive sleep apnea. But they have to be participating in a weight management program. And semi-glutide, Wagovi or Ozempic, it's a glucagon-like peptide, one, so-called GLP-1 receptor agonist that acts by mimicking bodily hormones, GLP-1, which targets the hunger center in the brain and regulates appetite and thus stimulates weight loss by decreasing those hunger sensations and it increases the feeling of fullness. Consequently, people eat a lot less and they decrease their caloric intake. Now, Wegovy was the first and only once a week GLP-1 receptor agonist medicine first approved for adults with obesity or overweight since 2014 based on clinical trial results. The STEP STEP semi-glutide treatment effect in people with obesity phase 3a program was a set of four trials with approximately 4,500 adults enrolled with obesity or overweight and those individuals without type 2 diabetes were treated with Wagovi they had an average weight loss of 17 to 18 percent of their body mass maintained over 68 weeks of treatment and they did well without serious side effects but the most common side effects were GI upset, nausea, vomiting, constipation, abdominal pain, distension, uh, belching, flatulence, GERD, some headache and fatigue, and some hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. The medicine has to be increased very slowly over 16 to 20 weeks to a final dose of 2.4 milligrams once a week to try to reduce these GI effects. And other adverse effects include pancreatitis, gallbladder concerns, even acute kidney injury, maybe damage to the eyes or retina, increased heart rate, and even suicidal thoughts. So this isn't something to just jump on the bandwagon because your friend has started it and lost a lot of weight. There's also a box warning of potential risk for thyroid C tumors. So no patient with a personal or family history of medullary thyroid carcinoma should use Wagovi. Also, patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome, type 2 MEN, should avoid Wagovi. Wagovi should not be used in combination with any other GLP-1 receptor agonist or weight loss product or other prescription drugs, herbal products, or over-the-counter weight loss drugs. This medicine has not been studied in individuals with a history of pancreatitis. So if you have a history of pancreatitis, you really should discuss your risk with your treating physician. Overall, it is another tool, and it's an important tool with some promising results. The newest kit on the block is Manjaro, which is also the generic name is Terzabatide. And the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved Manjaro in May of 2022. And it's a once-a-week uh, glucose-dependent insulotropic polypeptide, a GIP, along with being a GLP-1, a glucagon-like peptide-1 receptor agonist. And it's indicated as an adjunct to diet and exercise to improve glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes. And it's the first drug in class that has the GLP-1 agonist effect that has a dual hormonal effect and has been shown to reduce hemoglobin A1C by 2%. And it certainly surpasses all the other GLP-1 agonists, semiglutide, in weight loss up to 23% of total body weight. 
while not yet approved for weight loss, it was granted fast track speedy review by the FDA in 2022 and um, has been submitted for uh, the indication for weight loss in this year, 2023. And treating obesity can take months or even years. Uh, and unfortunately, most of these exciting GLP-1 agonists are very expensive. And a lot of times they can be out of stock for weeks at a time. And uh, many diabetic type 2 patients in my practice have commented how upset they are that they can't get their usual Victosa or uh, Ozempic uh, or Trulicity diabetic medications because so many people are getting them for weight. So this is a major struggle for patients as well as physicians to sometimes get these medications approved under insurance plans for various indications besides obesity, uh, besides diabetes mainly, i.e. for obesity. Hopefully, more patients will have access to the innovative treatments for obesity and hopefully in the future, like my son, the PhD in uh, molecular medicine and cancer genetics, Stetson Thacker, who's actually authored several columns on um, physical activity and health and what's the best protein supplement on our Speaking of Women's Health Dot com site. He's the father of Artemis Vera and the newest kid on the block, Beatrice Clara. Uh, and he said that he thinks that within 30 years we won't have any obesity. He is that encouraged by the advances we're making. I sure hope that that's true, uh, that when we're celebrating July 4th, 30 years from now, that that's the case. And there is some promise with some of these injectable medicines maybe being available down the line soon uh, because some people don't like to give themselves uh, injections. Now, a lot of the information I've covered has uh, been made available and is uh, in a column on our Speaking of Women's Health website written by our endocrinologist in the Center for Specialized Women's Health, Dr. Ula Abed Alawahab, and our graduated uh, specialized women's health fellow who is so extraordinary, Dr. Tiffany Cochran, who I hope we can recruit back to our center. Everyone just loves Dr. Cochran. And her partner in the two-year fellowship was Dr. Tara Iyer, and uh, she actually went on and got her obesity boards, and I did a CME podcast on uh, menopause and hot flashes and weight. And so even though that was designed for uh, physicians and APPs and people needing medical credit, uh, if you want more detailed information, I would definitely go back and listen to that podcast. And I have three threads. I have I podcasted my book, An Updated Guide, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause, that's one series. I did a series of several podcasts for free medical CME credit that anyone can listen to. And if you're a physician or a nurse practitioner or a registered pharmacist or a physician assistant, you can apply for free credit by answering a few questions. And then my regular podcast like this is. And the reason we focus so much on weight, because it is women's number one concern, but it just leads to so many other conditions. Even joint pain, five extra pounds, transmits 25 times to your joints. And 5% of women uh, will undergo a hip replacement in their lifetime, and 10% of women will undergo a knee replacement. And the knees really take a beating with increased weight. So, it's very important to try to prevent obesity and maintain physical activity, not use food for manipulation or as a reward, um, allow people to understand the signals of satiety, and to also understand that as you get older, very much different than childhood, but as you get older, it takes a lot longer for your stomach to communicate to your brain that you're full. 
And that's why the tip of only eating till you're 80% full is really an excellent one. Some people find it very helpful to weigh food. I personally don't. I think that's obsessive. Portion control is very important. Using smaller plates um, is very uh, good little tip. And if you can intermittently fast, assuming you don't have a medical condition or pregnancy or uh, migraine headaches that are triggered from prolonged fasting, that really does drop insulin. And you might want to go back and listen to my Memorial Day podcast of 2023, where I talked a lot about um, cholesterol and also being less sweet and things that reduce insulin resistance. Now, there are some other FDA-approved medications to help in the process of weight loss. Some may only be able to be used for really short periods of time, and others can be used as maintenance daily medicines. And they may act to help control appetite and cravings and block fat absorption. And they can have double benefits to help other medical conditions like diabetes, migraine headaches, depression. And these medicines are not for everyone. And they certainly have contraindications. So you have to discuss the benefit and risk with your primary physician or perhaps with a a physician that specializes in weight management. Some endocrinologists do. Number one, fentramine, Adipex. Um, It's a controlled drug prescription that can be used up to three months at a time if the BMI is over 30 or over 27 with another comorbid medical condition. And this acts as a sympathomimetic, like norepinephrine, to be released in the hypothalamus, which does definitely reduce the hunger signals. And it may inhibit serotonin and dopamine reuptake, which can help your energy level. It can have a stimulant effect of anxiety. So if you have anxiety or panic attacks, probably not the best thing. If you're already a poor sleeper, it may worsen insomnia. And it can cause constipation and palpitations. So in patients with cardiovascular disease, moderate to severe or uncontrolled hypertension, anyone with cardiac arrhythmias, seizures, overactive thyroid glaucoma, or any history of drug abuse, uh, this drug's not for you. And again, this podcast is not medical advice. It's just information to arm you to be healthy, be strong, and be in charge. And certainly this medicine should be discontinued if the target weight loss is not achieved. The second drug we use, topiramate or Topamax. Uh, Topiramate is a medication that's often used to treat migraine headaches. And it's also used to treat seizures and binge eating disorders. And it enhances the GABA receptor activity in the brain and it inhibits carbonic anhydrase. And topiramate topamax might help with the following. People that really crave soda and crave carbohydrates, people that are very um, anxious uh, and have insomnia. Now the side effects are paresthesias or nerve irritation. Some people have taste aversions, sleepiness, brain fog, mood impairment, Some people who take it for migraine, they have less migraines, but they feel like they just have brain fog. And even though they've lost some weight, they just don't want to be on the medicine. And rarely it can trigger acute ankle glaucoma. So we don't use topiramate in anybody with glaucoma, renal failure, or a history of kidney stones. And this medicine is teratogenic, so it should not be used um, with unless there's contraception in premenopausal and perimenopausal women. And it should definitely not be used in any woman who may become pregnant or is trying to become pregnant. Number three, the combination of fentramine with topiramate, CR. uh, The brand name is Qsimia. So this fentramine topiramate CR Qsimia combination is an effective FDA-approved weight loss medicine. It has the dual effects of the fentramine, which we've talked about, and the topiramate in the convenience of one pill. And it has been shown to be effective with about a 9% weight loss compared to placebo. 
It comes in varying doses and it can be titrated up based on tolerability. And it can be used as a maintenance medicines, medicine. It does carry all the same contraindications and side effects of the individual components which we already went over. And it can be cost prohibitive due to the expense. Now, Lyraglutide Saxenda uh, is a human GLP-1 receptor agonist that has the double benefit of treating diabetes. And it helps reduce hunger and cravings. And it is associated with a reduced cardiovascular events, which is good. And we certainly had Lyraglutide Saxenda before we had Wagovi and Manjaro. Uh, which are the blockbuster ones that I talked about at the beginning of this podcast. So anytime you give an injection, there can be local injection site reactions, nausea. It can slow down the stomach emptying, causing gastroparesis. And it may be associated with pancreatitis. And it cannot be used in any patients that have the MEN type 2 or medullary thyroid carcinoma. And unfortunately, the cost is generally an approval with prior authorizations, usually the biggest concern. So um, number five is naltrexone with bupropion XR Contrave. So naltrexone is an opiate blocker and bupropion, uh, brand name Wellbutrin or Zyban for smoking cessation, Wellbutrin for uh, depression, is a um, dopamine agonist norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, and it's sometimes used for depression. But when you combine the opiate receptor antagonist naltrexone, um, which can be used in low dose uh, for chronic pain syndromes, actually in alcohol abuse in higher doses, and in higher doses Narcan is injected to reduce you know, opiate overdoses, but this combination of naltrexone and bupropion is marketed as Contrave. And it helps with cravings and a hedonistic food drive. And it might have the dumb, double benefit of reducing smoking and alcohol use. Side effects can include mood changes, neuropsychiatric reactions, nausea, headache, insomnia, dizziness, dry mouth, And costs generally can be prohibited. So some weight loss physicians, um, like Dr. Lynn Patamachiel, who provided a lot of this information, who works in our Center for Specialized Women's Health as a weight expert, uh, she many times will frequently prescribe the generic version of bupropion with a generic uh, dose of naltrexone. Now, it is contraindicated if there's any seizure disorder because Wellbutrin can be stimulatory to the brain. It also cannot be used in uncontrolled hypertension or um, eating disorder, binge eating, um, and bulimia. And it cannot be used if someone's undergoing current alcohol or drug or use or in a person who needs chronic opioid use to control pain. Number six, Orlistat. It was the prescription drug Xenical, and now it's over-the-counter Alley. And it's a lipase inhibitor, which blocks about 30% of all fat intake. And it actually might be beneficial in adults with elevated triglyceride levels. And if you're someone who suffers from constipation, where fiber and water and Miralax has not helped. But you can get flatulence, diarrhea, bloating, abdominal pain, and you can reduce the uh, absorption of some of those really important fat-soluble vitamins like A, E, and K. Um, vitamin D is actually not a vitamin. It's a prosterol hormone, and I can't emphasize its importance enough. We did a special podcast just on vitamin D. I think it's like podcast number two. Um, and you can take vitamin D with or without food, but it's a little bit better absorbed with food. So if you've got some GI malabsorption problem or liver disease or kidney disease, we don't recommend using one of these fat blockers. But Alley can now be purchased over the counter. And if you get those liquid orange stools, it means you're ingesting too much fat. Number seven, super absorbent 
hydrogel particles and capsules, Plenity. And it's the latest FDA cleared weight management device. It's not considered a drug, it's considered a device. And it's been to be used in people who have BMIs as low as 25 to up to 40. And it's a super absorbent hydrogel capsule. Uh, and it's composed of modified cellulose and citric acid. So it creates like a 3D matrix. And it's taken 30 minutes before lunch and dinner with water. And once it reaches the stomach, it expands to occupy about one-fourth of the stomach volume as these thousands of small gel pieces. So it's not a medicine. It's not a st stimulant. It's a GI device. And it, re it retains that, that uh, 3D matrix structure as it goes through your small intestine. And then it begins to be broken down by enzymes in the large intestine. And this material is then expelled in the stool. And the results seen in the Jalesis loss of weight, the GLOW study, showed weight loss compared to placebo about 6.4% versus 4.4%, with the treated group having twice the odds of reaching over 5% uh, and 10% weight loss. As you might imagine, gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gas, and distension. But importantly, there's really not been uh, serious safety risk reported. But you can't use it if you're pregnant or have a history of bypass surgery or gastric or esophageal surgeries or a gastrointestinal disorder. And it's important to note that patients that participate in the study definitely followed a lower calorie diet and they involved themselves in moderate intensive exercise and they were just followed for six months, not long term. And we know that a lot of people, after they lose weight, if they don't have a maintenance program, they go right back up to the same weight or more. So there's not one magic diet, medication, or surgery that will answer for everyone in the fight against obesity. So we still always, every day of our life, have to focus on a healthy lifestyle that we can realistically do on a daily basis. But luckily, we have a growing arsenal of tools that can be utilized to help support you. And so if you've been working on this problem and haven't gotten anywhere, you really might want to seek out a weight management specialist, someone who's boarded in obesity medicine or has this uh, as part of their practice. So you have been listening to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. Thanks for joining me back in the Sunflower House. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker. And if you enjoy this podcast, please be sure to subscribe anywhere you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star rating. And if you like to see some of our podcasts and interviews uh, visually, you can get us on the Speaking of Women's Health Rumble channel. We're on Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest and LinkedIn, so you can find us in a lot of places. And I hope that on this very important American holiday, actually my favorite, I hope that you're able to enjoy a nice picnic, healthy meal with your loved ones on this joyous and patriotic day, and that you get some time to be outside and get some exercise. Be strong, be healthy, and be in charge.